Welcome to your module on qualitative research. This presentation will review some of the basic key elements of qualitative research as you shift gears into this broader category of research methodologies. So here you can see the learning outcomes for this presentation. We'll be defining qualitative research and comparing this to what you already know about quantitative research. And then we'll go into more depth about the different designs within qualitative research and some of the implications of those designs, such as sampling. All right, so starting off, it's really important to get a clear grasp on what qualitative research is. Remember, qualitative research is designed for a specific purpose, just like quantitative research. Quantitative is not better than qualitative and vice versa. They just serve different purposes. So rather than asking a specific question with a specific answer or proving or disproving a hypothesis like we do with quantitative, we're now in exploratory mode with qualitative. So in qualitative, we may not be sure what to expect. We may be just trying to learn about a problem, kind of leaving things open-ended, or we're trying to just define a problem better. We might be exploring different approaches to a problem. So qualitative research is often used when we don't really understand a phenomenon very well. It's also used simply when quantitative methods won't work. So for example, if we want to understand the meaning of something or an experience someone's having or perceptions or attitudes, this is when qualitative research is ideal. So if you remember with quantitative research where we collected data using instruments like blood pressure cuffs and surveys and scales and drawing blood, that was quant. And we still collect data in qualitative research, but it's actually very, very different and we use different methods to collect that data. So instead of drawing blood from that human being, we ask the human being to tell us their stories or to share their perceptions or describe their experiences. And this is often done during interviews or even a focus group where many people simultaneously share their stories. And this is probably the most common type of data collection in qualitative nursing research, but you might also see observations as another way to collect data. So observations aren't just watching, it's much more complex than that. It is in-depth, uninterrupted observation. And this is where the researcher really takes in the details of human behaviors, the ways humans interact, uh, maybe the way they use devices or instruments. A lot of times this is cultural research. And qualitative researchers might also be alongside their participants. We often call this participant observers, where they're conducting research and collecting data, but not necessarily in a passive role, quietly taking notes in the corner. Rather, they're part of the group they're studying. Maybe they're a newer member of the group. But you can imagine that this whole participant observer thing would probably raise some big red flags in quantitative research. However, in qualitative research, we're all about getting close to and immersed in the data. And there's a paradox here with this because how close is too close? And what happens if you get so close that you can't really see the data like a researcher anymore as this participant observer anymore? But what if you're too far away and you can't really get a nice, thick, rich data collection or good stories from the participants because they don't really know you and they don't really trust you? So this is an ongoing debate that we definitely won't be answering in this course, but keep this in mind and make sure you think about this as you read your qualitative studies. So going a little further with this qualitative and quantitative research comparison, Quantitative research is deductive, which really means testing hypothesis, or I'm starting with a statement that I am going to test. I'm going to test that statement. I'm going to deduce whether or not it's true. And as you've learned, some of the strongest quantitative research is in quasi-experimental or very controlled experimental set settings. And we're after a truth in quantitative research, one single truth. So for example, do I accept or reject a hypothesis? Yes or no? Now with qualitative research, we're more inductive. We aren't trying to answer one question with a concrete response. We're building up rather than breaking down. We're not deducing, we are inducing. We're collecting bits of data to build up to a response to a question that may have more than one answer. We're being inductive. And rather than being in that restrictive experimental setting, we're trying to capture the nature of reality in its natural setting and to be true to those individuals experiencing a phenomenon. We're in that more natural setting. So for this, we don't need as large of a sample. The sample size in terms of number of participants in qualitative research is not as much of a focus as it is in quantitative research. 
Now, you right, might remember the rule of 30s or power analyses for quantitative research and those nice big sample sizes, right? Well, in qualitative research, we could have a very rigorous, fantastic qualitative study with only 10 participants, and that is fine, and that is not a criticism of the study. The participants will tell us their stories, okay? And the key is that we are using purposeful sampling. So in many qualitative studies, we're looking for specific individuals who have experienced the specific phenomenon that we're concerned about. Remember qualitative sometimes is we don't know really much about this phenomenon. So we're gonna go seek them out. We're gonna go find these people that have had this specific experience that we don't know much about and we want them to tell us their stories. We're not gonna randomly assign them to one group or another. Now. We've already discussed how data collection methods will vary between quantitative, where we get that concrete data and those specific answers to specific questions, and qualitative, where we gather stories and words and perceptions and experiences and observations. Now, another key difference between quantitative and qualitative is data analysis, and this is really, really key to understand. So remember, data analysis is how we make sense of these piles of data we've collected. So maybe it's blood pressures, maybe it's interview transcripts. And we pull out information that helps us answer that question that we had in the first place. So for quantitative research, we run statistical tests on those piles of data and we create maybe statistical models to help us predict or to help us answer a question that will help us predict how much somebody's risk for hypertension goes up as their weight goes up. That's a quantitative data analysis. Now for qualitative research, we don't use statistics. We do something else that is kind of a big no-no for quantitative research. So for qualitative research, we analyze our data as we are collecting it. And we call this an iterative process. So we might do one interview and then we'll read that interview and we'll see maybe that some themes are emerging and we analyze that interview transcript and we analyze that data and then we connect and conduct another interview after that. The data analysis is iterative and ongoing at the same time that we're collecting data. And it often guides our sampling too. So did we answer our question already or do we need to interview more people to answer our question? So data analysis in qualitative research is done by human beings. Okay, so we might use technology to help us keep track of all those transcripts or all those observations and those notes we took, but we're not running statistical tests. It is the researcher's brain and often multiple researchers' brains that will make sense of those piles of data and analyze those qualitative findings. Now, as we mentioned before, sampling is very different in qualitative compared to quantitative research. So as you see here, who and how many people are included in the sample depends on what we're asking and how good that data is that we collected from our sample. Now, there aren't really any calculations or strict rules that all qualitative researchers follow for sampling, like you might see in quantitative research. This is both a strength and a criticism of qualitative research. Now, there's also this thing called data saturation that can impact sampling. Once data are saturated, we often stop sampling. So what's data saturation? Well, let's say you interview 13 middle-aged men about their perceptions of physical activity. And after that 13th in, uh, interview, you realize they're all saying pretty much the same thing. And a few of them might bring up some unique ideas, but they don't really answer your question. And in general, no new themes are starting to emerge because remember you're analyzing your data as you're collecting your data. Nothing new is really helping you answer your research question. That's data saturation. And you will likely stop interviewing participants once you see that happen. Now here you can see some different sampling methodologies as well, and these are common in qualitative research. So for example, convenience sampling where I sample just who I have access to. Let's say I work in a clinic and I just sample the patients who are in the waiting room uh, or sample from the patients in the waiting room. Purposeful sampling where I have a pretty specific list of criteria based on my research question and I seek out people who meet those specific criteria. And then you've got snowball sampling, and this is also pretty common. And I would do this basically by maybe asking those middle-aged men who participated in my study to tell their other middle-aged male friends about my study and see if I can interview them too. So there are a number of different types of qualitative research. Remember how quantitative research included randomized control trials and cross-sectional studies and longitudinal studies and quasi-experimental studies and so on. 
Well, there are many designs within qualitative research as well. So in this presentation, we'll be reviewing four common designs, phenomenology, grounded theory, ethnography, and qualitative description. Just keep in mind there are many other designs that exist out there that we aren't going to discuss here. So the first qualitative design we'll look at is called phenomenology. And this is a specific type of qualitative research focused on describing lived experiences of people. So people experiencing a specific phenomenon that we want to understand, and we're trying to learn about what people are going through from their perspectives. We need to hear their stories. So this is really focusing on the human experience and really the many, many human experiences. So within phenomenology, there are two subtypes, descriptive and interpretive, but both are really focused on humans' lived experiences. Now, most authors should state this is a qualitative study using interpretive phenomenology methodology, for example, but not all of them do. And this really goes for all qualitative designs. Some of them will just say this is a qualitative study. So you need to be looking at the aims of the study and really what they were asking to determine the qualitative, specific qualitative design. So if you see a study with aims that discuss lived experiences or meanings, then this should really cue you into the probability that you're looking at a phenomenological study. So a little overview here, phenomenological studies are trying to answer questions about human beings' lived experiences. And while there isn't a specific list of steps to follow per se, in terms of how to conduct every step of this type of research, interviews are the most common way uh, that we conduct data. You might see some observations or focus groups as well. And we also use convenience or purposeful sampling for this type of study. We need to find people who have had that specific lived experience. They've lived that lived experience that we're wondering about. Now, data analysis involves really looking over those interview transcripts or observations and classifying that data so that we can answer that question that we had. We don't just throw out a bunch of common things people said out there and call that findings. We want to really develop a sense of wholeness. What is the lived experience that these people described? So our outcomes should describe the participant's point of view and the researcher is interpreting what he or she heard and identifying what common themes exist to answer that research question. So the research questions for phenomenology are really asking the researcher to kind of add a layer of interpretation. They have to interpret what participants are saying. So for example, how does it feel to live with terminal illness? The next qualitative design we'll look at is called grounded theory. And this is a unique design because we're looking at a process or a theory. So we don't really review a lot of prior research before conducting grounded theory research so that we're really looking at this process we're interested in with fresh eyes and can be a little bit more objective. Now with grounded theory, we also recognize that processes and theories can be changing and dynamic. So when we look at grounded theory, our goal is to develop a theory, and often that theory describes a specific process that human beings go through. So grounded theory has specific steps of collecting data, and this is often from interviews, but it can be from observations too, and then analyzing data to develop a theory, but these two occur at the same time. Remember, qualitative research is iterative. It's an iterative process constantly happening all at the same time. So in grounded theory, we call this constant comparison. And constant comparison is when we're constantly coding and analyzing these transcripts, these data at the same time to generate a theory, then that theory is integrated and close to the data and expressed really clearly so that this theory that we're developing can be tested. Now, our sampling is most commonly called theoretical sampling, and that basically means that as we look at the data we have and we code it and we analyze it, we decide what data we need next to develop this theory as it emerges. So an example question for grounded theory, uh, for a research study that's grounded theory, is going to include a question about a process or a theory. So in this example, we're asking what is the process of recovery after a heart attack? Ethnography is our next common qualitative design, and this really comes from the discipline of anthropology, actually, but we often see it in nursing as well. Now, the focus of an ethnographic study is culture, and we want to study a specific culture, the behaviors of people in this culture, their knowledge, their artifacts. We want to study members of the culture in their natural environment to really capture the culture itself. Now, you might be imagining a researcher hiding in a tree, watching an indigenous group cooking a meal or interacting with one another. 
And sure, this might relate to ethnography, but keep in mind that there are many cultures in addition to ethnic and geographic cultures. So what about the culture of nursing students? What about the culture of emergency room nurses, etc.? So be sure to keep an open mind when you hear the word culture. So here we have the purpose of ethnography is to describe a culture's characteristics where we're identifying the culture and variables within the culture. Now, obviously, we will sample individuals within that culture, so it's often purposeful sampling. Data collection is often very intensive and includes a lot of observations, interactions with members of the culture, interviews, even reviewing documents and artifacts. But the researcher has to gain some kind of entrance or access or acceptance into that culture to get close enough to the data to get a true picture of what that culture really is like. So our data analysis and outcomes of ethnography aim to describe the culture. So for example, ethnography questions are often asking about common practices or behaviors of a specific subgroup. So here you can see what are the health management practices of older adult men in Thailand. So qualitative description is our last category. Sometimes you'll hear qualitative descriptive uh, also used. And the focus here is, the, as the name suggests, description. So every qualitative study has some level of interpretation by the researcher. The researchers have to make sense of what the data is and make some interpretations as to what they're reading. But qualitative description uses less interpretation and focuses more on straight description. And it comes from what we call a naturalistic perspective. So capturing things as they are in reality, in nature, and not adding in a layer of interpretation as much um, as the researcher. Now there's some criticism of qualitative description as it can be incorrectly used as a catch-all design. So where the researcher isn't really sure what to call their design, so they just say qualitative description. And there is also some excellent qualitative description research out there. But it's our job as the nurse to identify who is using this design appropriately and who may have just used this as a catch-all. So the key is that we want to stay close to the data we're clearly describing a phenomenon and using less interpretation than other qualitative methodologies. So we can see here the purpose of qualitative description research is to describe a phenomenon. So the nature of something, sometimes we're describing the barriers or the needs of a specific group, for example, and there aren't specific delineated agreed upon steps for qualitative description research, but sampling is often purposive or convenience sampling we need people who are able to describe a phenomenon to describe it for us. So data collection is often an interview or a focus group, and data are analyzed at the same time that we are collecting them. Remember that iterative process. So we also use something called content analysis to analyze these transcripts. And this is really what we use as we review the transcripts, we see what themes emerge, and one commonly used way to analyze data and to code what we're reading is using something called in vivo coding. And this is where instead of coming up with our own label, for example, for what we think we've read, we actually use the phrases and the direct quotes of our participants as themes and as codes to show that we're truly describing what they described. So the outcomes of a qualitative description study should be really, really thorough and clear. We want a really straightforward and comprehensive description of whatever our question was about. So a sample research question for qualitative description is, what are the barriers and facilitators of hypertension self-management in Navajo women? So we aren't doing a lot of interpreting here. We want to hear it straight from them.